Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, the first thing that I should say is that this is billed as a kind of a workshop and if I'm honest it's more of a, just a presentation. I'm going, to, I'm going to talk through some ideas but let's try and make it as interactive as we can. So if at any point I say something that you, you, you think is unclear, if you disagree with it, if you just think I'm talking rubbish and you want to point out a better way of doing things, all of that is absolutely fine. Just interrupt me and we'll try and, try and uh, I'll try and uh, make sure that we can kind of have the conversation that's going on. But I'm not, ten I'm not intending to do sort of worked classic workshop activities with people interacting to, with, with each other today, I'm sorry. So uh, we're talking about a, um, acceptance testing for continuous delivery. And this is the, the kind of schematic that I tend to use for a deployment pipeline um, that shows some of the common stages in a deployment pipeline. Uh, and I think it's reasonable to say that anything after the commit stage you can kind of think of as, as kind of representing some form of acceptance testing. But what I'm talking about specifically are these tests. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what I mean, how, how we define those, those sorts of tests. But fundamentally what we're trying to do between those two different stages, the commit stage and the latter, the, the latter stage of the pipeline, is to kind of separate out the technically focused, developer-centered testing from um, the user-focused testing that we'd like to evaluate our software. So you know, these bits are kind of saying, does the code do what, I, do what I as a developer think it should do? And these bits are really saying, does the, is the code useful to, as far as we can tell in the test, is it going to do what the users need it to do? So that's the kind of stuff that I'm really talking about. So the first thing that we can talk about in terms of what is acceptance testing, it asserts that the code do, does what the users want it to do. There's a nice way of integrating this into your development process, which, which I've used on, on a few, a few um, teams that I've worked with, um, which is that you kind of build it into an automated definition of done. So uh, if, you have a, if you have a user story of some kind, uh, as it gets close to the point at which you want to play that story, you're going to identify a series of examples or um, acceptance criteria that are going to describe if you know if I get this if I deliver this piece of value I, I would expect this example to work like this and the definition of done bit is that the team kind of agree that they're going to do a minimum of one automated acceptance test for one of every one of those acceptance criteria uh, for every story and if you adopt that you get very quickly to, to the point of having fairly good test coverage, behavioral test coverage of, of, of the behavior of your system from the point of view of the user. It means that you can kind of you know, create these specifications, work through them, and kind of iterate down to, 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 uh, to, to, to a successful outcome. They also assert that the code works in a production-like environment. What we're trying to do is that we're trying to evaluate not just our source code changes, but our configuration changes, our deployment changes, the specification of our infrastructure, all of those things. So any change that flow is destined for production flows through our deployment pipeline and can be evaluated at least in part uh, in the context of one of these sorts of tests. And we, as I've just said, we want to also test the kind of configuration and the deployment of our software as well as the behavior of it. We, want, we also want feedback in a timely manner. We'd like to find out just in time that what we've just done is a crap idea, rather than just too late. So we want, we want these to be efficient uh, in, terms of, in terms of our time to find out what's going on. I think there's quite a lot of terminology in this space. I think for the purposes of this conversation today, um, you can probably treat all of these things as similar. I can give you a, a, an exposition on the subtle differences between each of these things, but I'll bore you to death and it doesn't really matter. Acceptance testing, acceptance test driven development, BDD, specification by example, executable specifications, these are all these days used for as, at some level as kind of synonyms for, for what we're talking about. The terminology that I tend to use is that we are building acceptance tests that are created as executable specifications for the behavior of my system. That's the terminology that I tend to use personally, but all of these things are in common use. I have a personal annoyance with the use of BDD because BDD was originally designed to improve how we taught test driven development, but now it's just kind of test, tends to be talked about in the context of building high level functional tests, which are good, <laughs> but they're not enough. So a good acceptance test is an executable specification for the behavior of the system. We're trying to capture behaviors that, we, that are desirable in our system 
in a way that we can kind of work against those specifications to create a desirable outcome of some kind. Here's another kind of diagram that I tend to use in the context of continuous delivery quite a lot. This is a feedback diagram. I think if there's, there are several foundational ideas in continuous delivery, but one of the seriously foundational ideas is we're trying to get high quality feedback fast on everything that we do. And this is, this is kind of the f a one level of feedback model in terms of testing strategy. So at the outside of this feedback loop, we want to have an idea. We want to get that idea out into the hands of our users. And then we want to figure out what our users make of the ideas. At the inside of the, test, uh, of, of the feedback loop, we're going to do test-driven development, do very fine these sort of developer-centered tests. And in between, these are the things that we're talking about today. We're looking at these executable specifications that evaluate the software from the perspective of users. The reason why that's important is because, is because however great our TDD practices are, however good our unit test testing is, there's a subtle difference between the behavior of the system from that perspective and the behavior of the system from the user's perspective. A, a silly war story. Uh, I once worked on a, a fairly large project. We were building a point of sale system. Um, and there were about 200 people working on this project. We were doing full on TDD, extreme programming, all this kind of stuff. And at one point, somebody deployed the software into a test environment and found that it didn't work. And then they went back version by version. They found it hadn't worked for the last three weeks. So you need to do something beyond. So all of the tests were passing, but the software wasn't working. So you, so you need to do something else. You need this kind of user-centered testing as well. So what's the problem? Why, 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 is, why, is, why is this an issue? I think, I think there's, there's, there's often a disconnect be between what users want of the system and, uh, and, and what the software delivers. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to bridge that disconnect. The, the problem of defining what the software should do is a difficult problem. The problem of defining how the software should do it is a different difficult problem. And all too often, what we tend to do in our, in our requirements process and in our testing is that we conflate those two ideas together. So we want to try and tease those things apart and treat them as separate, separate activities through our development process. And we'd like our, uh, if, you know, our testing strategy to kind of reinforce that kind of thinking and separation. So let's not try to solve both of these really hard problems at the same time. Let's try and pull them apart and, and treat them separately. In lots of organizations, the, the kind of regression testing is done like this. There's a, so there are tools. That, this, this is one that where you kind of have a manual test case. You kind of capture a series of steps. And then some poor person has to sit through and go through and follow those steps. If you've ever done anything like that, if you're anything like me, you get to step 15 or something like that, and it's different to what it says in this. It just doesn't work very well. Um, these things are messy uh, and, and uh, not very high quality. So this is saying, open a browser. The browser opens. Go to blah de blah de blah expected results, and so on and so on and so on. Somebody spent real time, valuable time, where they were having fun, maybe drinking beer or something, doing this. This is slow, low quality, expensive, unreliable, error prone, fragile, and results in hard to understand test cases. The next step um, is, 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 is this, and, and say, so, okay, so let's not do the manual testing thing. Let's, let's automate our, our functional tests. That's a good idea, right? And you tend to end up with, the first time that you do that, you tend to end up with tests that look a bit like this. Um, and these, this, is, this is what I call clickety-clickety tests. This is just kind of recording all of the clicks. This is completely about how the system works rather than what the system does. So this is slow to develop, low quality, expensive, unreliable, error prone, and fragile. Yes? Yes. Yes. Kind, kind of, kind of but, but I, I think more than that, what, what they're doing is that they're confusing what the system should do with how the system achieves that end. What I'm going to describe is a process where you can completely separate those two ideas. That's, that's, that's what I'm, we're going to try and work through and get to. Okay? Any more questions before we move on? Everybody okay? Good. So there's, there's this kind of disconnect, and we've got to build a bridge between, between these two sides of the picture somehow. We've got to figure out how we're going to do this. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could kind of establish some sort of shared language 
for expressing a user's need that would capture the intent of our software without saying anything about how it worked. So, technique. Always capture any requirement from the perspective of an external user of the system. This is the classic kind of agile user story kind of thing, and I don't really care whether you do as A and X, I want Y, so that Z, or given when then, or any of those sorts of things. None of that, those sorts of training wheel templates don't really matter very much, as much as in the story, say nothing about how the system works. If you've got user stories that say things like add a new column to the database, it's wrong. It's not a user story. The users don't care whether there's a new column in the database. You want to capture the behavior. You want to capture the intent. Avoid any reference in the, in the specifications of your, your executable specifications to how the system works. You want to say, you want to kind of think about it from the point of view of the driver, not the, the point of view of the mechanic. Focus on what the user wants of the system and try and capture that. Um, link the executable specifications to user stories. Make the step, a tiny one between user stories. I have several clients that don't bother with user stories anymore. They just write the executable specifications because it's essentially the same thing. So try, try and think about those sorts of terms. What we're trying to do is capture the intent of the software rather than the, the, the mechanisms. As I said, there are a variety of kind of user story templates that you can apply. This is a kind of classic one. As a user, I want something or other so that I can achieve some benefit. And then we've got these acceptance criteria. And these are the things that we're going to write a test case for each one of these. What, 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 what I usually do with a team is that by default, you're going to have at least one accept, automated acceptance test for every acceptance criteria. The team kind of signs up to that discipline. And in exceptional cases, somebody can argue, argue that oh, we don't need to do this one or that one. And then the rest of the team will argue them out of that because that's stupid, usually. <laughs> so next, make the definition of done a minimum of one acceptance test per criteria. This kind of plugs it into the development process. It means that you're, auto, you're driving the development process from testing, initially from these high level, high level uh, these behavioral specifications for the system from the perspective of an external user of the system. A good kind of sanity check when you're writing requirements and these test cases is to imagine the least technical person that you can think of who understands the problem domain. And if they were to read the test case, they should be able to understand what it means. It doesn't necessarily mean that that has to be in a human language, but it has to be a language that's simple enough to, to parse if, even if you're a non-technical person. And I'm going to show you some examples of what I mean by that as we go through. But we're trying to get... It's not, it's not a requirement of this that end users can write the specifications. I, I don't see that personally as a, as a, as a, as a necessary goal. It, but it, it can be a handy side effect, but they do need to be able to read it. Avoid technical stories. Always try and get into the fundamental user need. Make each story, each specification, as small as possible. Break the, break the development process up into many, many small steps rather than fewer large steps. And that makes the specification easier, the testing easier, the development easier, the release deployment easier, de-risks the deployment as you go into production, all of these good things. So what's so hard? Why, 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 why you know, people have been trying to do this kind of functional test for decades. They've been trying to do this and usually what tends to happen is this first bullet. The tests break when the user interface, well, when the system changes, particularly the user interface, but, 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 but any aspect of the system that the test is talking to, it tends to be fragile. What this is, is a problem of coupling. It's a problem of coupling between the test case and the system under test. So we can kind of start addressing that by, re by, by separating the concerns more and reducing the coupling between the test case and the system under test. The history is littered with poor implementations of this. I particularly despise UI record and playback systems. They're kind of so fragile, you kind of record it once and then the next time you change something, you, it breaks because some box is a pixel to the right instead of the pixel to the left or something like that. I hate record and playback of production data because it's big and heavyweight and it's not specific enough to evaluate what we're trying to do. I don't like dumps of production data at all, really. There are some specific scenarios, some cases for testing where there's an argument for production data, 
But if all you're doing is replaying production data through your system as your testing strategy, you don't really have a testing strategy. You have a, I hope that kind of works out sort of strategy. And nasty automated testing projects. There's been, there's been a lot of those over the years. There's been a lot of nasty automated testing projects that kind of try and force fit an approach. And there's still a lot of those things that are advertised and, 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 uh, and, and used these days. I don't think any of them solve the problem. I think what you need is a broader strategy and you need to think about how you're going to use the tools rather than the tools themselves. The next thing to, to, to consider, one of, the, one, one of the projects that I worked on that was kind of foundational in my part of the thinking of, of continuous delivery um, was, uh, was we were building the point of sale system that I mentioned, I mentioned before. And one of the insights that we had that started me down the road to thinking about things differently in that context was we, we this was a very large project. There were about 200 people working on this, on this software development. And there was a team of, I think it was four or five QA people who were dedicated, fo dedicated and focused on automated testing. They'd got a suite of about, if I remember correctly, it was about 12 automated test cases. And Presumably, at some point in ancient history, those tests had run once, but all the time I was there, they never ran. They never worked because what happened is you got this team of four or five people who were trying to keep up with a team of 200 developers who were going like mad changing the system. It just didn't work. And one of the insights that we had on that project was close the feedback loop. It's developers that are going to commit a change that's going to break a test. Therefore, it must be developers that are responsible for, for the test. Um, and as, as soon as we did that, we started, one, we started getting the tests more stable and ha having them passing more regularly. And two, we started bu building more tests. So developers are the people that will break the test. But this is particularly true if we can get to these executable specifications because if it's a specification that says what the system does but not how the system works, if that test fails, it means that the software is not fulfilling its specification. So we can modify it to, to try and make it, make it uh, work. So this last one, a separate testing QA team owning the automated test is a toxic anti-pattern that I have never ever seen work, not once, ever. It and everybody tries to do that nearly, um, and it just doesn't work. So anybody can write the test. Whoever, whoever's got the best picture for what, for what the specification should be, it doesn't matter. It can be a, a developer, a tester, product owner, a business analyst, don't care. It doesn't matter. But as soon as the, the tests start running, the developers own the responsibility for the tests, and it's their job to keep them running. Specifically, the developer that makes a commit is responsible for fixing any defects that, that arise out of that commit. So developers own the, 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 the feed, own the, the tests and that closes the feedback loop. Yes? So, uh, so I, th I, I think that in this kind of context, Traditional QA is one of the roles that changes most significantly. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't go away. My preference is to have professional testing people as part of the team, at least on the sorts of software that I was, you know, I was usually involved in writing. I prefer to do that because professional testers think about testing differently. They have different kinds of insights and the sorts of things that we want to do. So what we want to do is that my, my, my suggestion, my, 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 my advice, is that you want to automate all regression testing. If you have any, autom any test of any kind that you need to run twice, you automate it. But there's a role for exploratory testing that's, that's, that's very valuable. So, so human, be human beings are going to do different kinds of things to, to machines. We what we're trying to do is that we're trying to get a repeatable, reliable process to, to release software into production. And if it's repeatable and reliable, it kind of rules us out as a species because we're not repeatable and reliable. So we don't want human beings doing the repeatable and reliable stuff. We want the human beings doing the stuff that we are wonderful at, which is kind of exploring and trying out wacky ideas and trying to break it in different interesting ways and all that kind of thing. So I think that becomes the role of the tester. The other part of this is that I think, I think it's an anti-pattern to have a separate QA team at all. So I think that people in those sorts of roles 
should be sitting with and working on the software alongside the development process and the, de the, de the development activities. So you're trying to set up the process. The other kind of aspect of this is that you don't want to kind of build mini waterfalls inside your iterations or sprints. You don't want to wait until the software is finished and then get the testers on the team to look at it. You want to organize yourselves as a team so that you, you, you're, both, you're all making progress and you're all going to come to a stop at the same time, roughly the same time. Which means that the, the testers are evaluating the software while it's in the process of being built. And again, that's another one of these things that kind of it calls out the need for continuous integration. If we're able to build these changes incrementally, step by step by step, it means you can more deeply integrate the testers into the process. Okay? Yes? Yes. 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 Sometimes developers do feel that. I, I'm, I, they're wrong. <laughs> Jez will tell you that the data, the data says that if you apply the kinds, you know, these and other techniques of continuous delivery, um, people, the teams will spend 44% more time on valuable work. This is an investment. There's, 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 a, there's a great story of the HP LaserJet team, uh, and they did, a, they did a, break, a before and after breakdown of their development process. The kind of after picture, they had eight times as much effort, proportion of their, their development effort, going into creating new software. And there was a, there, but there was a massive amount of effort that was now spent on automated testing, continuous integration, and all those sorts of things. So those, these, these activities are, it's unfortunate that as a species, one of the things that we're not very good at are kind of the kinds of problems where we have to do, be disciplined now to get a reward later on. It's like, it's like dieting or exercise, which you can see I'm an expert at. Um, you know, if, if I know that I shouldn't drink glasses of wine, you know, it makes me too fat. But I quite like glasses of red wine, and if I see one, I tend to drink it, and that's not a good idea, but I don't think about it at the time. Similarly, development teams ought to know by now, because the data's in, that automated testing allows them to go more quickly. It allows them to move forward with more surety. Yes, you spend more time doing, doing some kinds of problems, but that time is paid off by you spend very little time analyzing failures in production and debugging and trying to debug logs of what was going on in production because those sorts of failures don't happen as much. There was a, there was a, a survey of production failures in, in software systems done a couple of years ago. And, um, and the, they looked, at, I think it was about 6,000 different projects. And they looked at the different projects and then tried to identify common patterns in the, the, the nature of failures at, at the point at which a production system falls over. The first thing that was kind of amusing, but not, not tip, completely relevant, was that the, the most common line of code at the point at which a production system fails is a comment that says, should add exception handling here. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but the other finding that they came up with was that 72% of production defects are caused by the kind of errors that all programmers put into all software in any language. Off by one errors, the scope errors, getting a conditional statement the wrong way around, all of those kind of common mistakes. And if you just do, that, they didn't say specifically unit testing or automated testing, but if you have a disciplined approach to testing, you can eliminate that set, almost that 72% of, of defects in production. From the data that I, the, the, the subjective picture that I have of people practicing continuous delivery is you can do a lot better than that. It's the, the, the defects in production are, are probably in the order of two order, reduction by two orders of magnitude. That's a huge, huge saving for a development team, but at the cost of having to do a bit more work on the testing. So I think it's a good investment. The most efficient team that I've, I, I ever saw was also the most focused, the most diligent on, on, on automated testing. So you also mentioned your expectations in the test environment should be like production line. Yep. So how do you, you said even production data analysis is going to be Yep. I mean, how do you do the test data? I'm, I'm going to get there. 
I'm, I'm, I, yes, I'm sorry. So the, the question was, I, I said that, um, that I, I don't like using production data, so how do you get the data in for the test? A lot of, you know, I'm, going to, I'm going to describe that, and I'm going to describe some strategies for that, but the, 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 the quick synopsis in answer to your question is that I think that the vast majority of data, data in tests should be synthetic, and I'll explain why as we go through. Okay? Any more questions? Yeah, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about all of these things. The rest of this talk is pretty much going into each of these in more detail. Yes? Uh, the first thing is that you're talking to the second test, the what and how. Yep. The what keeps changing from time to time. The what keeps changing, how do we uh, establish the fact that we have a good set, good repository of accepted tests that would be the beginning of the time? So, so, the, so the question was, um, um, what if the what keeps changing uh, in trying to separate what, uh, what from how? If that's really happening, what that's saying is that you're exploring and you don't understand what the problem you're solving is yet, which is fine. That's, that's kind of part of software development. But what that means is that you're, you're coming up with some behavior of the system that you no longer want and you want now to be different. So you have to throw away the old test and you have to write a new one. But that's, an easy, that's going to be true, however you organize your testing, if the, the requirements are changing. Yeah? <coughs> Any more? How do you come up with the acceptance criteria? Um, the, the easiest way is... Sorry, say again. Yes. So, so really, the, the, the best way to do it, if, if you have a user story, just think of an example that would demonstrate that user story. Let's say we were going to write a test for buying books in Amazon. So I, you know, I, I, I would start to be, come up with an example that was a bit more specific. I'm going to go and search for a book called Continuous Delivery. I'm going to select the book. I'm going to put it in a shopping basket. I'm going to, to go to the checkout. I'm going to pay for the book. I'm going to then confirm that I now own the book. And pretty much the language that I've just used is the language that I would use in my test case. So, so, the, so, the, so the, the specifics of, you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to order this book, I'm going to pay this much money, and, and those sorts of things are the example that I'm talking about. That's the, that's the acceptance criteria that we're describing. Okay? Yes? Yep. De develop, de I'm sorry, the question was, well, developers are now overloaded. I, I would disagree with that. The, the developers are, are, are working differently, but they're trading off one set of work for a new, another set of work. Uh Maybe, um, so, 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 so maybe, it might mean that that's, that's no longer a good distribution of people in a team. That's possible. Um, but what I'm talking about is, into, into, uh, as I said, I, th I think this changes the QA role more than it, probably more than it changes. Other, all of the roles are affected when you adopt continuous delivery. But QA in particular, I think, changes because QA is classically seen as kind of the gatekeepers of quality. And I think that what we know is that that doesn't really work. And so you've got to build quality into the system from the outset. You've got to figure out how you can design quality into the system and build it. One of the most effective, well, the most effective way that I think that we know how to do that is that you, you, you aim to ma make your systems testable. And you do that by writing the tests first and using them to drive the development process. It's what the driven bit means in, in test-driven de development, really. And so, yes, the developers are going to spend time writing tests. But it's, a, it's an odd kind of idea, really, that they don't anyway. If you're writing software and you don't know whether it, whether it works, what does that really mean? It means you're not doing a very good job, probably. I think the conflict that I've seen is typically the ratio will be like 60, 40, or 70, 30 of what needs to be the testing. Uh -huh. Maybe now you don't need 30 persons to be testing anymore. It's like, so you perhaps just need 10 percent or 15 somewhere else. I, 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 think, I, I think that might be true. Uh, I, I, I'm not, so so if, if I think back to the teams that I worked on, 
there were usually a team of four or six developers and usually there was one or two QA people on that team in addition to the developers, usually. Um, which isn't very different to the kind of ratios that you're talking about. So we're not talking about sacking loads and loads of people or anything like that. I, I, that's not what I'm, I'm trying to suggest at all. But um, I, I think... I think you've got, to, you've got to establish and close this feedback loop. You've got to get, you've got to get this effective uh, process and you've got to drive the development from the tests, which means that it must be taken, the responsibility must be taken over by the development teams and then the, the, the testers are supplementing that, that effort. They're bringing expertise, insight, and the, the kind of manual testing that kind of says, does this paint pretty pictures inside my head so I can figure out how to extrapolate and, and use the software in, in another context and all that kind of stuff is what they're really doing. Um, we, when, when we were built, uh, so, uh, so I, uh, some of these ideas are, are based on a project that I worked on a startup when we were in the middle of writing the, the continuous delivery book. And we built a financial exchange. And when we were doing that, we, we, we very highly valued our testing people. And the testers liked it more. They, they enjoyed their work more than they had before following some stupid manual script. Yes? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, th I, th I, think those, I think those things largely become unnecessary if you take this broader strategy for, for, for the developer-centered testing and the, the, the ex kind of acceptance testing that I'm talking about. So the acceptance tests at one level are kind of a super integration test. They're evaluating all of these things. If I, uh, let me just skip back to the, uh, to the picture that we started out with. For a minute. This is kind of my default model for a, for a deployment pipeline and this pretty much defines, uh, uh, loosely anyway, the, the, the kind of testing strategy that I recommend. So, so you have this kind of developer-centered testing aiming, aiming at the, you know, the the technical quality of the software that we're building. And, and that's best performed through, through test-driven development. You have this acceptance test-driven development. That's kind of from the, the stuff that we're talking about from the perspective of users. And that covers all kinds of behaviors. It, talk, it talks about non-functional requirements and functional requirements, security issues, scalability, resilience, performance, all of those sorts of things as well. And if you've tested all of those sorts of things, I'm not quite sure. Occasionally, very rarely, there might be an ad hoc need, a, a, you, there might be some utility in doing a specific integration test for a specific piece where you can discover a common kind of failure more quickly. But mostly, uh, what we found was that those, those system testing as a whole is really what this is. And uh, integration testing is kind of covered by that because we're testing the, the system in a lifelike deployed environment in production-like test environment. So the, it doesn't add very much. I don't know what we'd learn by doing system testing or integration testing on the whole. Sorry, say again. It's not user acceptance testing because the users aren't doing it. <laughs> it is acceptance testing. <laughs> It's, yes, it's, it's from the perspective of an external user of the system. I think, I think I, 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 I'm, I'm playing with words slightly. I, I, I think that um, it, it is very similar to the, the goals of this are very similar to the goals of user acceptance testing. But this is a dramatically more detailed level of testing than you get with doing with human beings. And it's a lot faster and a lot more efficient and a lot higher quality process. Yes. Yes, so, 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 for, so I, I can give you another little war story. So uh, th there are two aspects to this. So there's the kind of technical assurance that you can get from your, from your testing strategy and from your deployment pipelines and that kind of stuff. And there's the, the cultural assurance that you might need in an organization. So when we were building our exchange, um, uh, we, for a while, the business didn't trust that we'd tested it enough. And we, we had the conversation, we said, 
we're running something like 50,000 or 60,000 test cases uh, you know, on every commit and we fail the build if any one test fails and you're not going to find any bugs. <laughs> they said, nevertheless, so they decided that they wanted to test before we kind of turned it on live in production. So we said, well, okay, if that's really what you want to do. So we did that for a little while and after about three months, they came back to us and said, you're right, we don't find any bugs uh, and this is a waste of our time. Do you mind if we stop doing it? I said, no, no, that's fine. <laughs> And that seems like a, so, you know, you've got to build up the tr tr trust at some level organizationally. But what I, I believe that what I'm describing is a significantly higher quality approach and outcome uh, than any army of manual testers. The one thing that that's not true, that you're always going to end up with problems that you don't anticipate in production. But, that, but those are going to be less common they're going to be not the sorts of things that you find by just kind of randomly banging on the system. They're going to be the edge cases, the corner cases, because those are things that you don't think about testing. Everything else you'll have tested. We, we got test, when we were building our exchange, we got completely test obsessed. We tested everything that we could think of about our system. And if a defect happened in production, which didn't happen very often, um, then we'd add a new, new test to catch that kind of failure in future. So, so we, we were in production for 13 months and five days before the first bug was raised by a user. So, so you trade all of that stuff around bug triages and all of that kind of stuff. You trade that off by spending some more effort on doing all of the autom automated testing. Yes. Sorry, I can't hear. No. Hello. Yeah, ah, sorry. Yeah. So I was just talking about that as we are moving towards that DevOps uh, while leveraging that CI CD pipeline. Isn't it good to have that product test suit level execution instead of calling that acceptance test? Like uh, now the world is moving towards that uh, within 11.9 seconds, I wanted to deploy my code into prod, right? Uh -huh. So isn't it good to have that product test suit level uh, execution? We should consider your functional regression, internal I internal uh, integration or external integration and API test as a productive test suite, right? And execute it and then release the code into prod, right? So that's what the things is coming into the mind while delivering your code within 11.9 seconds. So productive test suite execution will be the another way of pushing your build with quality within zero defects. So, so I'll, I'll give you the, the consultant's answer is that I think it depends. It, it depends on the probably depends on the problem domain, it depends on the seriousness of the software. I, I, I think of mostly the kinds of systems that I ended up working on through the, the, you know, the part of my career that, that I learned these lessons, I think of as what you might think of as high consequence software. There, were, you know, there, there was lots and lots of money flowing th through those things. These days, people's lives depend on some of the systems and all that kind of stuff. So the level of rigor, the level of assurance that you want in those sorts of circumstances, it's probably slightly different than if I was writing software for my mom's cake shop. But nevertheless, what we're talking about, th th there, there are multiple values here. One of the, val one of the, 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 the properties of this, this test-driven approach um, to development that I value very, very highly is the impact that it has on the quality of the designs that I produce in my software. It and allows me to build more modular, more loosely coupled software with better separation of concerns and all of these things. But you get that by trying to make the software testable and that's kind of an outcome. And so this strategy, I think this, I've, I've applied this strategy through, through clients and through projects that I've worked on in all sorts of different problem domains, in all sorts of different uh, technologies. And I think it's, it's just better. I think this is just a better way of working if I'm honest. I think this gives you, gives you a, a, a better outcome. So you can kind of pa parse the kind of test. One, one, of the, one of the things that lots of people talk about is the test pyramid. I'm not a big fan of the test pyramid because you don't get enough acceptance tests in that. And maybe it changes. It depends on the nature of the software. The, the, the picture of my, the wheel that I draw of, of the deployment pipeline, uh, that's, a, that's a, a mechanism, a process that's, that's optimized to get fast feedback. If you can get the answer to I, there's no more work to do on this piece, piece of software before I release into production, 
and I can get that, that answer back as a red squiggly line in my IDE, I would take that. But I don't know how to do that for the sort of software that I, I tended to work on. And so a deployment pipeline is a compromise. It's a compromise between immediate feedback um, and a level of assurance. So what I usually say to, cust to customers is that the, from the commit stage, I'm looking for feedback in under five minutes with a roughly 80% uh, level of confidence that if all those tests pass, everything else is going to be OK. And then from the acceptance test phase, I'm looking in trying to get an ans and performance tests and everything else. Uh, I'm trying to get a definitive answer. Is there any reason why I can't release this into production in under an hour? And so if you can answer all of those questions, you can get an answer back in nine seconds. Cool, that's lovely. But it means that your software is dead simple, which is nice. That's, that's a good thing. But not all software is like that. So what I'm talking about is the strategy. So the, 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 the fundamental point here is to optimize for fast, high-quality feedback, I think. I think to, to get a high-quality outcome, you've got to test from the perspective of the technical perspective the TDD stuff, and from the user's perspective. And for me, that's a starting point. If I was writing software for my mom's cake shop, I would still have acceptance tests. I would still do TDD, and I'd, I'd, I'd get answers in seconds, or mi minutes anyway, but uh, back from all of that system. Yeah? Okay, okay let's, let's move on. Um, so, we want to try and separate what the system needs to do from how it is that it does it. So here's, here's a picture of a system, and we've got some groups of users that are interacting through different channels of communication with the system. And typically, if we were going to write automated tests for something like that, we'd effectively replace the users with a whole bunch of test cases like that. If one of these APIs were to change in a way that broke a bunch of test cases like this, the only way that we can kind of manage this, this, this situation is to go to each individual test case and correct it. That's not very good. It's not very maintainable. But we know how to solve that kind of problem. We can kind of raise the level of abstraction, increase the level of indirection, and we can kind of isolate those things a little bit from one another. So we can kind of pull the test cases up so that they're focused on what the system needs to do, not how it does it. We can replace these bits here with essentially plumbing that translates what the system needs to do with how it interacts with the system. And now, if this break, if, if this changes and breaks a bunch of test cases, we only have to fix it in one place, and that's shared between all of the test cases. So that's kind of, that's kind of the first step in separating the what from the how. As you go down this route, what you tend to find is that you tend to find that the, the infrastructure has a number of properties, there's a number of behaviours that are kind of useful to exist in there. And we'll, we'll explore some of those as we go through. The next thing is, the idea is to separate deployment from testing. In test-driven development, every test usually is going to control its start conditions, we don't want to have dependencies being between tests and all that kind of stuff. But in this case, that doesn't work very well, because the cost of starting the system up might be quite expensive. If you've got a big, big application and you're starting it up for every single test case, your test's going to be slow. So wouldn't it be nice if instead of doing that, what we could do was start the system at once and then run a whole bunch of test cases against one version of the system. We could share out the costs of starting the system up um, uh, between all of the test cases. This also means that acceptance testing uh, is, is a rehearsal of a production release because now we're going to automate the deployment of the software in our acceptance test environment. We're going to automatically deploy it, get it up and running, and then we're going to start running our acceptance tests against it. Yes? I'm just going to talk about that. So this, allows, this, this gives us the opportunity to run tests in parallel in a shared environment and lower the, the startup overhead. But there's a problem here, so, and this is a problem of isolation. So any form of testing is really about evaluating something in controlled circumstances. And that means figuring out how you're going to isolate test cases from one another. So we'd like to be able to isolate the system under test. We'd like to draw a boundary around the stuff that we're responsible for, because that's what we want to test. And we'd like to identify, isolate test cases from one another. So we could run 
two, two or more test cases in parallel in the system that we're working on and not have them in, in, interact in unpleasant ways. And finally, we'd like to isolate a test case from itself so we can run the same test case over and over again and get the same results every time. That means we've got to think about the state that we're managing and so on. So let's drive through those in a little bit more detail. Isolation in general, I think, is vital to, 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 to inform your testing strategy. So let's start by thinking about the system under test. Let's imagine that we're working on a system like this, a big organization. We're working on system B. Uh, and we are, this is the kind of system that's kind of downstream from system A and upstream from system C. And what most organizations will say when they've got something like that is, oh, we must do end-to-end -end testing. Uh, and that's a problem. Because if, you're, if you want to do end-to-end -end testing here, it means that you don't really have control over these interfaces because there's a whole system in the way of those interfaces. So, for example, if I wanted to simulate what happens if this system was sending me garbage or what happens if this system, the communication channel, was broken or down, I can't do that because there are real systems in the way that's too complicated. I can't, I can't really get in and test my, my, my part of the system. But worse than that, it kind of means we're not going to be experts on the rest of the, all of these other systems. And so it means that, that our system really is kind of not really in a precise state. It's not really deterministic in, 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 in approach. So it severely limits the kind of testing that we can do. So what we really like to do, so this is an anti-pattern. This end-to-end -to -end testing is really an anti-pattern. What we'd like to do is something more like this. We'd like to write test cases right at the boundaries of our system. They're going to talk to our system through its natural interfaces. If our system has a REST API, it's, our tests are going to talk to it through a REST API. If it's talking sockets, it's going to talk through sockets, whatever that is. But they're going to be right up against the edges of our system. Now we can kind of fake all of the weird circumstances. We can kind of fake you know, strange connection defects and all that kind of stuff, as well as the normal running of the business. Now. The problem with that is that when people look at these kinds of systems and say, yes, but you've got to do end-to-end -end testing, is that what they're worrying about are these bits. They're worrying that these things, these interfaces between these two parts of the system are, are going to break in some way. You're going to make a change here, which is going to screw up the behavior, the downstream behavior. And so we've got to find another way of solving that problem if we want to have this, isolation, this, this test isolation thing. So I think that what we'd really like to do is something like this. We'd like to have a bunch of tests focused on each of these things. From our perspective, from Team B's perspective, all we are interested in of System A is does it talk to us in the way that we think it talks to us? So we can write some test cases for that, for these two systems. And when we do that, the number of test cases that we're interested in is really quite small. So we can run all of our detailed tests to evaluate our system and then we can kind of just have sort of a verification. Has the interface to us changed or between us changed for these systems? There's one step that you further that you can take this. And that's something called user contract based testing. So what you can do is that we could write our tests that define our assumption of how system A is going to talk to us. We then hand those tests over to the system A team. And the system A team will run them as part of their continuous delivery pipeline. And if one of, the tests, one of those tests fails, they now know that they've broken their contract with us. And then we can figure out what to do. Yes? What do you do in a situation where you've got an acceptance criteria that you know, spans multiple different systems? Yeah. So, so, so I think that gets into a, a, a different, the way that I think about it gets into a different part of the problem, which is what's the scope of a deployment pipeline? Uh, and the way that I usually describe it is a I, I think of a deployment pipeline is scoped as an independently deployable unit of software. So that can be a monolith, a whole system, or it can be a microservice. And part of the microservice game is that you don't get to test them with everything, <laughs> kind of by definition, which is hard. That's one of the things that's hard. It means that you've now got to uh, think very, very seriously about, about the level of abstraction of the communications between those pieces and use techniques like messaging that give you a little bit more insula insulation because there's a little bit more, more wiggle room between the services and all those sorts of techniques. 
the step beyond that is, is, is so, so if you go down that route, if you kind of do it in the microservices kind of world, you, the organizational strategy is to try and divide up your team in a way so that you minimize that coupling so that mostly you don't have those cross-service interactions. And if you do, this, it's usually calling out a problem in the design, I think, in terms of the coupling. You can't do, you can't do it perfectly, but if it's commonly happening, I think it's a problem. Um, this is one of those things that I think is just hard. I, I, I think that the, the trade-off between, I, I, think, I think most people, I, 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 I think including you, in, in, when you were talking about stuff this morning, when you talk about continuous delivery, you talk about it almost being a prerequisite to, to have a, a modular, loosely coupled um, architecture. I'm not quite sure that I think that's right. I think that, I think that you can absolutely make it work with, uh, with a monolith. It's, but there are different constraints. So you can get huge value, that you, and, and there's other things that you don't. But there's a trade-off. There's, 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 there's no silver bullet. So the, the, big, the big downside of a monolith is, um, is, is being able to do live, live deployments and, um, and the, the, the cost of engineering and infrastructure to get fast enough feedback. The big downside of a, a, a microservices architecture is that you, you, you step right squarely into one of the hardest parts in, of computer science, which is coupling and dependency management. And you've got to take those things seriously. Uh, and I think you solve those problems by more sophisticated design rather than anything. I'm not, I'm not quite sure that that's fundamental. I don't, think there's a, I don't think there's a silver bullet testing strategy, at least not one that I know. Yep. Does it also cover all the access ladders as far as the logging system fee is concerned, or does it just focus on the contract part of So, so, so these, what, so, so, so the, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the question was, do, when we're talking about the verifiable outputs here, does that cover all of the different kinds of interactions with, with, with system A? So remember that we're driving this behaviorally. So we're, drive, we're driving these te the, the testing from trying to specify the behavior of our system from the perspective of an external user of the system. So that should pretty much be defining all of the behaviors that you want of the system. So if there are any interactions with the downstream system, that's going to cover all of them pretty much. Yes. 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 So the, the sequence that I recommend is the one that, that is the one that I've shown. Start off, with, so start off by the one that I'm describing. So start off by creating the acceptance test, the, the executable specification for the behavior of your system for this particular story. Write that first before you've done any written any code. So now, when your when that test passes, when that specification is met, you're done. Then you use TDD, 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 TDD to meet that specification and then you're done. So that's kind, of, that's kind of primarily it. And then you might want to think about other specialist kind of tests like performance tests or you know, resilience or scalability or security and those sorts of things. But, but primarily, that a lot of those you can just treat as kind of behaviors of the system from the point of view of a user of the system. Uh -huh. Uh, in, ter in terms of the deployment pipeline, yes, you want, you want the fast cycle first, the commit stage, the unit tests, and then you want to run the slower tests afterwards um, so that they're, they're operating in parallel with, with you, you moving on and doing useful work. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to need to press on or, we, or we're not going to get through the rest of the, 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 the slides, if that's okay. So, test isolation. The next thing is we'd like to be able to run a test case in parallel with other test cases. And if you want to do that, we've got to make sure that the, that the test cases don't leak data between them. And there's a, there's a simple way of doing this. So I've seen people do complicated things like try and hold open transactions in a database so they can roll back later and use fake databases and all that. And I don't want to do any of that because I want to test my software so that as far as it's concerned, it's deployed in production. It can't tell the difference. 
So it's going to be using the same database, the same schema, the same technology, all of those sorts of things. But I want to, I want to be able to run these things in isolation. And there's a, there's a simple little trick is that you can usually find every case where I've ever looked uh, in, in a system, you can use the natural functional isolation in the application to isolate test cases from one another. So if we were testing Amazon, every test would begin by creating a new account and a new book in the store or a new product in the store that you were going to work with. Every single test case. And that means that they don't bump into each other because you're going to be creating new instances of those things for every test case that runs. If you're doing eBay, it creates a new account and a new auction and so on. And that kind of gives you this ability to run these things in parallel with each other without any kind of tidy up costs or anything like that so you can move forward quite quickly. The next step is that we want repeatable results. We want to be able to run the same test over and over again in the same environment, ideally. So if I run my test case twice, it should work each time. Here's a, here's a trivial example. So I'm going to have a test, should place an order for a book. So I'm going to have a store and I'm going to create a book called Continuous Delivery. Uh, Jez would recommend that to you, I'm sure. Um, we're going to place an order for the book. <laughs> you, could, you could buy more. <laughs> Uh, and then we're going to assert that the order is placed. And the first time we run that, that's fine. So, there's, so the, the bit that's interesting in this, in this example is this. So if we run that test case the first time, somewhere in our system, some, somehow there's going to be a data store of some kind. And when we run this for the first time, we're going to create the book, Continuous Delivery. And then when we run it for the second time, ah, it, we're not in the same state anymore because the book already exists. Maybe there were other tests that went on and they changed the price of it. Or the, made it go up because it's such a good book something like that but but anyway it's going it's going to invalidate the scenario so we can cheat what we can do effectively i'm going to anthropomorphize my infrastructure so my infrastructure is going to say when you say create a book called continuous delivery my test infrastructure is going to say i know that you don't really care what it's called so i'm going to name it for you i'm going to call it continuous delivery one two three four and whenever you see it, you can refer to it as continuous delivery, but I'm going to map it in the, inst in the context of this test, backwards and forwards. And the next time you run this test again, I'm going to create a different one, continuous delivery 6, 7, 8, 9. And so now we've got isolation between the same test, test case in, in, uh, uh, again. So I would advise you to alias your functional isolation entities and name mangle them. So, so, so whenever you generate one of these things, create a unique name for that thing, and that, that name is only visible in the context of the instance of a particular run of a particular test case. And therefore, there's no data shared between test cases. After you've run all of the acceptance tests, sometimes it means that your system is in a slightly weird state in terms of the data, but that doesn't really matter because you're just evaluating the behaviors of the system. Yes? I'm sure that there are scenarios where stuff could matter, but mostly, no, it works really well. So, so, so you know, within the context of a test, you're creating all of the test data that that test needs. All of it. But you're not destroying it. So no. So other tests could interact with them potentially. Like something like some, some, something like something like just a listing of things. Or like a search on it. Yes. Uh, yes. But they're quite unusual because usually they're, they're, they're contextual by, uh, by account or, or, or product or something like that, those sorts of lists. So that's what I'm saying is so that you isolate those. I did some work with, with Siemens Healthcare and every test that they wrote started off by create a hospital. <laughs> because that was kind of the, the level of granularity that started off the whole thing. And then the test was, you know, was isolated because all of these things happened within the context of one hospital. So I am sure that there are some problem domains where this might not work, but it works for kind of 99.9% .9 of cases that I've seen. Yes? Why don't you scale it off? Because it's slow. And it's not really scalable because, it, because it, you, you'd have to do that between each test. And if you were running tests in parallel, you can't really do that. You can't really share the system. So this is a more efficient way of doing it. Um, 
there's a level of testing that you must do in production. I don't think that's enough for some kinds of systems. Yes, but if, if production is going to kill somebody, if you introduce a bug, I don't think it's due diligence that you didn't test before you got to production. So, so, so there's a difference between whether you're kind of doing this, you know, in, in, in terms of environment management, there's a difference. But I, but I think in terms of testing, you need an isolated environment. For software, that's serious. That's that's you know that's you know, that's that's going to hurt people or lose people's money or something like that. I think that you need to be, you need to be sure that it does it does what you think it does before you release it into production. So I don't I th do you think just putting things out into production on its own is okay in some circumstances. Basically, if you don't mind if your software breaks in production, it's okay. But the sort of software that I work I, on the whole, I don't want to do that. I want to be more diligent. Next, we want our tests to be repeatable. So uh, here's, here's, our, here's our system, is that we, there's an external system, here's our system on the test, the bit that we're interested in. Here's the kind of the, the, you know, the level of isolation in our code that isolates that from the rest of the system. And here's the, the, the kind of interface, the, the, the sockets layer or the, the, the REST API or whatever it, whatever it is. And we want to fake those things. We, we've already said we want to eliminate these external systems. I, I, my mental model is that what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to put the system under test into some kind of test rig, some harness. So you're trying to plug it into this, this thing that allows us to evaluate that piece of software effectively. And so we can kind of do this. So we can, through configuration at deployment time, we can decide in production it's going to talk to the real external system. Here it's going to talk to some kind of stub that's going to fake the behaviors of the real system. I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure that I understood the case. So, so, uh, so like you said, right, that you are essentially creating data scenarios externally uh -huh. as, a, as a starting point for that acceptance test case you run. So do you, do you create those data scenarios, starting points, and, and then save them in a data room and take it from there? Or do you no. innovate and put it into a SQL and then... No, so, 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 so the, the way in which the, the, my preferred route is that you populate the system to get it into the state that you want it to be in for, for your test through the interfaces that you would use to normally populate the system. So you register the users through the user registration process. You, 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 you add scenarios. So we, we were building an exchange. So nearly all of our tests started by, by creating a, a, an account to trade, to trade with, tr creating a trader to trade against, creating a market in which to trade, starting the market, Putting some prices into the market. So one of the outcomes of this strategy is that you optimize your software in weird places. So so we we once had we had uh, one of the banks connected to our beta site to use our stuff, and they said we've just tried to create a thousand users, and your software is broken. And we said why is that? And they said because because it, it came back in two seconds. And he said yeah, that's <laughs> that's about right. <laughs> so. So you optimize it in weird places to, 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 to make the test more testing more efficient. But that's a good thing. That's, it means that the quality of the whole system has, you know, tends to go up. Yeah, I just want to emphasize, right? That, that, I don't think it does, but it makes your API really, really good. Yes. Yes, yes it does. Yes. Uh, what this does is it makes your APIs really, really good. And that's a good thing. It's a great example of tests. It, exerting a force on the design of the system. Yeah. Keynote crashed on me. I've not seen Keynote crash before. Let me find that. Uh, acceptance testing. Hmm. 
There we go. All right. We got about half an hour. Right, so back to here. So we can use these test doubles to be able to isolate our system so we can kind of create this, this, this test rig that we can plug our system into to evaluate it. And through configuration at deployment time, we can decide if we're running a test environment, we, kind of, we, we plug the fakes in. And if we're running in a real environment, we connect it up to the real things. Uh, and then, then that kind of, that, we take that a little bit further. So, so if he, here's our system. Uh, here's our system under test here. Here's our test infrastructure. Here are our test cases running on our test infrastructure. And we're going to create a back channel of communication from our test infrastructure to be able to inject data into our system as though it came from an external system or collect outputs from our system uh, where our system is talking to another system so we can make assertions on it. So these things don't have to be massively complicated simulations of the external system. All they have to do is, ass is assert the, inject the, the, the data that we want or assert the, the, the outcomes that we're looking for. They can be relatively straightforward, the, these stubs that we're using. I think that, I think that, that it, as, as I've kind of been leading you down a bit of a track, and I think a simple domain-specific language helps us to address a lot of these problems. It means that the test cases are easy, easy to create in the first place. I have, this is a bit subjective, but if you, if you, build, if you build the first couple of test cases that you write using this, this kind of approach that I'm about to describe, is probably going to be a little bit slow. Once you start establishing the DSL though, it takes about as long to write one of these test cases as it does to manually execute the testing. So the second time you run it, you're winning already. So this is a really powerful strategy to move forward because they're very abstract and they're, they're easy to do. They're easy to read, easy to maintain. They separate, they very cleanly separate what from out. I'll go back to the example that I mentioned before. Let's imagine that we're writing this, this, this book buying test case. Uh, we're going to go, we're going to go, so here's my test case. This is literally what, this is what the script would look like. So I'm going to, I'm going to go to the store. I'm going to search for a book called Continuous Delivery. I'm going to select the book and I'm going to put it in my shopping cart. I'm going to go to the checkout. I'm going to buy the book for however much the book is worth. And then I'm going to confirm that I now own the book. Okay. So that's the language. That's what, how, what I would write for my test case. Now for a moment, think what that means. I've just described that to you, and I said nothing at all about Am how Amazon works. So I could have some code layer down that interpreted all of that. Went to, when I say go to the store, it goes to the, the web page. And when I say search the book, it goes to the, fills in the search field with the book and all that kind of thing. But equally, if I was designing a robot that did book buying at my local bookstore, I could drive the same robot from the same specification. I'm going to go to the store. I'm going to search for a book. The level of abstraction is such that we, know, we don't care what the system, how the system achieves the outcome. This is really, really quite powerful. It also means that we can kind of abstract these complex setups. I mentioned the setup that we commonly use when we're building our exchange, creating, creating a market to trade in, starting the market, putting prices in it, but creating traders to trade against it, create, creating accounts to trade with. We had one line that would set up, set, because we did that lots in lots of our cases, we had one line that did that in our test case. It was about 12 or 15 different interactions with the back, back end system, including registering users and accounts and putting some money into the accounts and all that kind of stuff. But we could do it in one line. So we can go really quickly with these kind of things. Some examples. So, so there's the, the BDD stuff, the BDD tools are useful in this context. I, I think that certainly many of the people that were involved in building the tools had this kind of approach in mind. I don't think all of the tools kind of enforce this approach. So you see some really horrible kind of cucumber and spec flow kind of scenarios where the clickety clickety, you know, go to this URL, type in this value and all that kind of stuff. You've got to get the abstraction right. But when you do get the abstraction right, these tools are really effective. My own preference is, is actually to use an internal DSL rather than an external one. 
So I'm in my tool set, I'm writing the DSL in, in, in the language that I'm using, and that gives me the power of a development environment and all those sorts of things. It requires a little bit of discipline to keep the separation of concerns and design, to design the, uh, the DSL, but it's really effective. There is an open source thing called EasyB that, that does this kind of thing, but mostly the way that I do it is, is I just build the infrastructure myself. So this is a Python version of my stuff and a Java version. So here's, a, here's an example test case. This is a real test case from, from our exchange. Uh, it starts off saying, should support placing valid buy and sell limit orders. If you were a trader, you'd understood, understood that context, what those words meant. It says we're doing trading, we're going, to, we're going to select a particular marketplace, we're going to place an order in the market, we're going to check feedback, we're going to place another order and check feedback and so on. Here's another one, this is going through the fix API placing a mass order, placing an order to match against it and confirming that the match happened. If you were a trader, all this, although these are written in Java and they've got dots in and camel case, if you were a trader you could read that. You could understand what it meant. This is kind of the next layer down. This is kind of the implementation of the DSL. And the next thing that's kind of useful with this, with this, because we've got this placeholder, this language that we're building, we can do some useful things. One of the useful things that we can do is that we can fill out a load of optional parameters. So if I'm doing a scenario, I'm trying to create a test scenario where I don't really care very, I just, I, I just want a bunch of orders in, 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 in somewhere. I don't really care the detail of the orders. I can just say place order, place order, place order, and my test infrastructure will just make up an order that will work for me. Or... I can be completely precise, I can specify every parameter of the order if I'm being particular in, in the way that I, So again, I can move forward quickly uh, or with precision, whichever I, whichever I want. This is the equivalent of that for one of the other APIs, this is for the fix API. We, were, we, we ran our tests like this for a long time and then after a bit we started realising that actually uh, these test cases are still saying quite a lot about how the system works. And so we, we refactored it and we ended up with test cases that looked more like this. So we have an annotation here which is saying this is through the fix API which is a programmatic API for trading. Uh, this is through the, the user interface, through a web-based web user interface and this is through a public API that we provided that allowed uh, traders to write their own bots that would trade against our exchange. And we're doing trading, we're going to place an order, we're doing so on. At runtime, our test infrastructure would say okay, this has got these three channels, so I'll run this three times. First time I'm going to plug in the translator for the fix API, next time I'm going to plug in the translator for the deal ticket, and so on. This just sort of, dem you might not have this problem, but it demonstrates the level of abstraction. These test cases care nothing about how the system works, they only care about what the system is supposed to do. And that's a really, really powerful tool. I had a client uh, a couple of years ago that was re-architecting their system. They built, they built ERP systems and they had a load of old unit tests that defined the, the behavior of the ERP system and they, they, I showed this to them and they, they kind of took it on. They had, uh, the channel was the, the old system or the new system. They rewrote some tests for the old system and then they could cross-verify behaviors and use that to develop the new system. It's a very, very powerful technique. So, evolving a DSL sounds like a horribly complicated thing. And it sounds like an awful lot of effort. And th th there's probably a little bit of work. Um, the, first, the first time that, that we did this on projects, it took us, took us a week or so to build the first test case and think about this. The last time I did it, because I'm now used to the patterns, it took me about a day to do this in a system that I hadn't seen before, to build the first two test cases. So this is not horribly complicated stuff. There are some patterns at play here that, 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 that you need to think about, but it's not terribly difficult. The strategy that I would recommend to you is to start, pick two, you know, kind of reasonably general cases, write the specification for that, and then do the plumbing to make that work. You do, do, the, do the DSL layers and the, the translator layers. Um, to make that work for a couple of simple test cases and then just let the team at it, let the team and if the DSL doesn't yet have any language that they need to express a requirement just let them make up the language 
that worked, that strategy worked really effectively for us. You might, as the developers take that on to do, to do the, the, the plumbing bits of code to make it all work, you might refine the language a little bit, but to keep the DSL abstract and so on, but, but it, it's, a, it's, it's quite a scalable strategy and, and, and a relatively simple approach to moving forwards. What I'm describing is kind of this four layer of architecture for testing. So at the top, we've got these executable specifications. They're written essentially in the language of the problem domain. They express ideas from the perspective of an external user of the system. The next level down, we've got this domain-specific language stuff. It does the kind of name translations and all of that kind of thing that we were talking about. Uh, and it, it's shared between all of the test cases. This is one of the mistakes that people sometimes make using Specflow or Cucumber, is that they end up writing um, a, a, a feature file for every individual test case and there's no shared code and so that's not a very scalable approach. But if you kind of think about this as a domain specific language and a common language that's shared between the cases, you, it gets scalable very quickly. It works, it works effectively. The next layer, layer down are the protocol drivers. These are the things that translate from the, the domain, uh, the problem domain, into the, the, the talking to the real system. So these are the things that, I don't know, use Selenium to go and talk to Amazon to, to, to navigate around the website and all that kind of stuff. And then at the bottom you have the system under test. I've, I, I, I work as a consultant these days and I've had many of my clients have picked this up and have started operating this in a whole variety of different problem domains. And it seems like a very effective strategy. And widely applicable. Next, we want to be able to test any change. So test cases should be deterministic. One of the things that often makes this difficult is time. And there are two strategies for that. We can either ignore time if time is not very important in your system, or we can take control of it. So here's some here's thinking about those. So ignore, ignoring time, we're just going to filter out any time-based fields. And it, when we're comparing, comparing values, we're just going to ignore, ignore timestamps and stuff like that. The advantage of that is that it's dead simple. The downside is that it, it can miss, miss problems if there are pro bugs in the time. And it doesn't allow you much control over time-based scenarios. For systems where time is more important, then I think that this is a better strategy. You take control of time. And the best way that, that I know of doing this, and this is also true at the TDD level kind of thing, at the, the low level test level, but you treat time as an external dependency uh, and, you, uh, and you fake it basically in the context of the test. This is incredibly flexible. Um, it's slightly more complex in terms of infrastructure. It meant, for example, that what we could do when we were testing our exchange, we could, run, we could run, test long running scenarios. One of the things that we used to do is that we used to we would have tests that would fast forward to the next daylight savings chain change to make sure that our software worked through daylight savings change times uh, and that kind of thing. So here's a, here's a little example. This is a made up example. The other ones that I've shown you so far were real tests. This one I just made up. So here we're going to go to a library. We're going to borrow a book called Continuous Delivery. I'm not trying to sell it to you. Well, I am trying to sell it to you. We're going to assert that the book's not yet overdue. We're going to time travel forwards one week. We're going to assert it's not overdue. We're going to time travel forwards four weeks, and we're going to assert that it is now overdue. This isn't a great test case. There are too many assertions in it, but it's just trying to demonstrate the tool. The bits that's interesting are these bits, the time travel bits. So how do they work? So here's our system under test. Here's our test infrastructure. And if we've got, if time is a factor in our system, somewhere or other, there's going to be, whatever our language, there's going to be a line of code that looks vaguely like this, system.getTime. If we're doing that, the only way that we can control time is to change, change the time on the servers, and you don't want to do that because that gets really messy really fast. So what we can do is we can cheat. We can put a level of indirection again. So instead of asking the system for the time, we're going to ask a piece of our code for the time. Let's call it a clock. And now we can get in the way. We can cheat. We can make the clock tell it tell whatever time we want it to. So maybe we could have a clock like this. By default, it's just the system clock. But we can also set the time to a new value and tell the clock what time to report. And now we have our back channel of communication to our test infrastructure again. And 
We, when we say time travel, our DSL is going to say, okay, well, it's this, this many milliseconds forward from the, uh, from the epoch and tell the, tell the clock to report that time. And you can do these long-running time-based scenarios. If you're doing that kind of thing, then one of the things that you probably don't want to do is run time travel tests at the same time as you're doing other kinds of tests because your system's going to go crazy then. Or two time travel tests at the same time is probably not going to be good. So you could tag your tests like this and say this is the time travel test, so it needs special treatment. This is a destructive test, so I'm going to break bits of the system, that needs special treatment. This test requires a specific piece of hardware and that requires special treatment. And now you can start to imagine a piece of software that at runtime interprets those tags and allocates those tests to different parts of your test infrastructure to, to evaluate them. This is a little animation of our version of that piece of software. So over here, this is the normal case. We have one, one test environment and we have a bunch of test hosts that are testing, sharing that one test environment. And here we've got time travel tests where each test has its own version of the application. So these are quite expensive tests, but you don't have many of those. And then there's here, there's some destructive ones. So we, we, we built that visualization just when we were building the software to do the test distribution. Finally, we want our tests to be efficient. We want to be able to test our software quickly and efficiently. If our product, one take on efficiency is this. So if our test infrastructure, if our production infrastructure looks something like this, but a the most interactions look like this, then maybe our test infrastructure looks like that. We don't need it to be a complete clone. We just need it to be representative of the interactions uh, in the system. If occasionally there's a different route through the, through the test infrastructure, maybe some requirements you know, have some different servers, maybe our test infrastructure looks like that. But we can kind of cut that down. We, we don't. Continuous delivery is expensive in infrastructure. We're going we're gonna to throw hardware at solving problems or the cloud at solving problems. So you need quite a lot of compute resources. But you can, you can kind of be sensible and kind of manage, manage that sensibly. Modern systems are often distributed, often complex, often asynchronous. And that starts to add complexity. We don't want to be confusing ourselves with worrying about asynchronous systems and race conditions at the level of abstraction of this kind of DSL in our test cases. So we want to build into our DSL the, 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 that's synchronous. So as each instruction in our DSL operates, we're going to step over and, and until that instruction is complete, you're not going to execute the next line in the instruction. Um, a good way of doing that in an asynchronous system is to, is to, you know, you issue the instruction to do something and then you look for the concluding event to, to, to signal that, that that's being finished. Uh, here's a tr trivial example of this. This is another made up one. So I'm going to send an asynchronous place order message. I'm going to wait for order confirmed or I'm going to fail on the timeout. And I build that into my, into my DSL level language infrastructure. So I, I reuse those behaviors over and over again. Uh, next best to that, so, so if you don't have a concluding event in this kind of scenario, my first suggestion is to ask why not, because it probably pointing, it probably would be a better design if you did in your system. But if you really don't, and you, you, that's not something you can do, you can implement as a second best a poll and timeout mechanism where you kind of, you, you kind of just from the test infrastructure, you're going to say, is the result ready for me yet? No. Is the result ready for me yet? No. Is the result ready for me yet? Yes. I'll now I'll move on. That's less efficient, but, but it, it can work. What you should never, ever, 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 never, ever, ever, ever do is put weights and sleeps in your tests. Nearly every, I reckon I could make a decent living going and fixing people's test infrastructure just for that. This is a horrible anti-pattern, which everybody does. The best case is it just makes your testing slow and inefficient. If I'm putting a 10 second wait in to make sure that there are no race conditions and, it, and the interaction finishes in a, in a millisecond, I've just wasted 9.999 9 seconds where I could have been doing more testing. Um, 
the worst, what really happening though is that it's not really solving the problem. All you're doing is that you're just shifting the, ra the race condition out. It might work, it might work sometimes, but it's not really a solution. So you want to do one of these two things rather than, rather than put weights into tests. If you've done all of these things, the next bit, what tends to happen is that as you get more and more tests, you, like, you, the feedback starts to get slower. And so then you need to think about scaling out. And if you've you followed my advice, scaling out is relatively easy because you can run all these tests in parallel. So now you can do the thing that I was talking about before. We can have a, here's a release candidate that we've identified. Our acceptance test environment comes free, pulls the release candidate down, deploys it to a test environment, spawns out a bunch of test hosts. It's going to run tests against that shared environment. It's going to collect the results and it's going to feed them back and tag the release candidates with the results. One last thing, one last thing. We, we've talked a little bit about data. Uh, as I said, mostly synthetic data, but I just want, I, th I think there are three different data scenarios that are just worth exploring. Um, and there are different ways, different approaches to each of those. Uh, so we're interested in transactional data, the kind of data that you build up as part of the normal operation of your system. We're interested in reference data, kind of lookup data, postcodes. Um, symbol tables, that, that kind of stuff, read-only data mostly. And we're interested in configuration data, data that kind of defines the, 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 the behavior of our system in some manner. And then we've got these three options. We could use production data, we could generate the data in the scope of the test, or we could use versioned test data. By versioned test data, what I mean is that somewhere or other we have data stored and when we start the system up, we say, ah, well, you're starting up in an acceptance test environment. I will pull this version of that data down for you. So how, what should you do? For transactional data, I think that you should never, ever use uh, production data. It's too big, too heavyweight, too inaccurate. So generate that in the scope of the test using the sorts of techniques that we've talked about. Don't use versioned test data either. Generate it in the scope of the test. That's by far the best strategy, in my opinion. Next, reference data. You don't really want to use production data for reference data because often it's too big. You, you don't want to be loading millions of postcodes into your system just for testing. It's going to be slow and unwieldy. So you probably do want to generate that mostly in the scope of, of your test. But you could decide under some circumstances to just have a restricted subset. So instead of having, I don't know, 15 million postcodes, you just have 50 and hard code those, because it's read-only, the fact that it leaks, might leak between tests doesn't matter very much. And then finally, configuration data. For the configuration of our systems, ideally, we'd like the configuration when we're testing to be as close to the production configuration as we can get it. Because we'd like to test that configuration as well as everything else. So we would like, by default, the configuration of our system in a test environment to be the production configuration. And then we just override bits of it that we don't want. We don't, you know, we don't want to access the real production database, and we don't want the real, you know, the, the real passwords for external communications and that kind of thing. There are some weird kind of tests where you're kind of testing testing the scope of the configurability of the system, where you might want to generate it on, in the in the scope of a test, uh, and you want version test data to override those secrets and stuff like that in your acceptance test environment. So, in summary, don't use UI record and playback systems. Don't record and playback production data. Uh, don't dump production data into your test systems. Don't use nasty automated testing products. Um, uh, don't assume that they're going to tell you what you need. Think about your testing strategy and, think, and take it seriously. Don't have separate testing QA teams. By all means, have professional testers, but have them working and collaborating with, as part of the development process, not as a separate stage. Don't let every test start and initialize the application. You gain more flexibility by separating those two steps. Don't include systems outside the scope of your system. Think carefully about what you consider to be the boundaries of your system and test to those boundaries. Don't put weight instructions in your bloody tests. Sorry, uh, does pe do people want to take a picture of that? Yeah.
It's just people have got their cameras out. So let me just finish. Okay. How do you automate without the weight? You do what I said. You, 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 you look for the event or you do a poll and a timeout. You don't do weights. I, I tell you what, you can hire me and I'll come and show you. <laughs> Tricks for success. So do ensure that developers own the tests. Close that feedback loop. Do focus your tests on what the system needs to do, not how the system works. Think of your tests as executable specifications and use them in that capacity. Make acceptance testing part of your automated definition of done. Build it into your development process. Keep tests isolated from one another. Use the functional isolation and temporal isolation techniques. Keep the test repeatable. Use the language of the problem domain. That's, that's the really, really powerful tool here to get you the right level of abstraction. Do stub external systems. You don't want to be testing, you don't want to be taking on the responsibility for testing the world. Test your system, not everybody else's. Test in production-like environments. Evaluate your software, deployed and configured as close to production as you can achieve. Make instructions appear synchronous in the test case to keep you sane. And test for any change, whatever the nature of the change, you should be able to test for it. And finally, keep your tests efficient. You want to be able to run thousands, tens of thousands of these test cases and not feel a barrier to adding a new one. So you want to keep them efficient. Some extra information if you want to look up about this. Jez will be pleased to see that I'm, I'm recommending our book. There's a chapter on acceptance testing which is completely in line with the philosophy that I've described here. This talk goes into a bit more technical detail here and there, I think, than the, than the chapter, but it's good. There's a great book called Specification by Example, uh, which talks about the general specifications and how to come up with some of those examples, those acceptance criteria in your stories and that kind of stuff. And this is really about the data stuff and the data manager refactoring for database. It's not directly related to the stuff I've talked about today, but it's a, it's a good book to, uh, to, to reference. There's a few other links in here as well, which uh, you'll get when you get the slide de slides. I'm surprised we finished on time, but we have. Thank you very much. Yes. So let's say we within the shopping cart example you said, right? We have to, we want to delete the user, right? So uh, as per your overall uh, approach that you have been taking, do you first start with registration? doing a, ma a mock purchase of a particular product uh, and then do the deletion and yes. ensure that all the things as a part of recommendation, the purchase yes. history gets removed as a part yes. of it? Okay. So, so, so what, what, I'm trying to tr what I'm trying to tr achieve in terms of the test isolation is that I don't want, I don't want, I don't want there to be any required test ordering. So I don't, I don't want to have to run this test before I run this other test to get for a particular scenario. So yeah, that means that kind of forces on me the requirement that each test is completely responsible for getting the system into the state that it needs to be in to do the evaluation that I'm interested in. So if I was deleting a user, yeah, first I'd create the user and then I'd delete it in the scope of the same test. And does the infra also be, play a role as far as the acceptance test is concerned? So let's say a uh, system under test uh, integra uh, integrates with a legacy system and there are certain certificates that exist between those two. So does the acceptance test include so infra I, so as well? I, so I, I think that gets back to the stuff that I was talking about before when I was talking about the, the system A, system B, system C. Uh, so, so primarily, I want to focus my testing on my system, the bit that I'm responsible, responsible for developing software for. Anything external to my system, I don't want to test that. because And I don't want it to be there. Because if it is there, it means I can't properly test my part of the system. So I want to get rid of that. Um, there are some circumstances where some external piece might be considered part of your system, in which case bring it inside and test it as part of your system. But, but mostly, if they're genuinely external systems, then I want to stub them out. So, 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 that's, that's, so all of this, to my mind, is the scope of acceptance testing. I see no role for separate integration testing, particularly. 
So uh, I have a no, question as well. You mentioned about the weights, right? There's also another problem when it comes to implementing automation. It's about assertions. You referred to that there should be just one assertion yep. as such, right? In acceptance tests, you're really going through a particular scenario of sorts, right? Yep. Search for a book, buy it, and verify if it's purchased. Yep. What type of assertion strategy should be there for such cases? So, so I, like to, I like to have simple, explicit assertions that tell you what the test is doing. So at the, at the end of the test, it's going to say, I'm asserting that this, this thing happened. Along the way, in order to get the synchronous behavior of the step, there are probably implicit assertions in the, built into the DSL. So let's say I'm placing an order to get something into a particular state. Then inside, it's going to fail my test if the order doesn't get placed. So there's an inbuilt assertion, but I'm not going to surface that at the level of the DSL language. It's okay. Any more? Yes. Sorry, 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 I couldn't hear you. We should. Yep. Uh, well, if, you, if your system's asynchronous, you've got to cope with the asynchrony. I'm not. So, so I'm, I'm sorry that that wasn't what I, I don't think that's what I was saying. What I was saying was that if your system is asynchronous, you've got to deal with that in your DSL. You've got to you've got to make the DSL in each test case. You've got to make that synchronous. So you do that in the implementation of your DSL. Sure, but, but my point is, is that at the level of abstraction of these test cases, these acceptance test cases that I'm talking about, you don't want to be dealing with the hard problem of the concurrency in software and race conditions and stuff like that. So you, you must build that into the language to, to make it sane, because otherwise you, you kind of, you're way up here at one level of abstraction and way down here in the weeds in terms of concurrency. So you, that's not sustainable. So you want to try and build your language, your DSL, that your test cases are operating so that they are, with, re with respect to the test case, it's the synchronous steps, even though your system is asynchronous underneath. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you.